Hi, I'm Steven and this is episode 5, A New Hope, of the SIPGRAPI 2021 course on the plane-based geometric algebra. In this episode we will actually do some programming. Now, I know that everybody of you, when you walk out of this course, will want to get their hands dirty with PGA right away. So I want to point you to some resources and a place that you can go to for more information before we begin. And that would be by vector.net, um, which is a, a great website that has an overview of a bunch of geometric algebra libraries. Um, for example, the Klein library is a production-ready C++ library that implements PGA, definitely one worth taking a look at. Um, but you will also find uh, more cool information on byvector.net. There's this little tools tab where you can download simple reference implementations for a variety of languages. Look at Cayley tables, evaluate expressions, things like that. There's a forum. Um, there's also a Discord. You can find the link here. Always lots of users online discussing geometric algebra. And if you must, there is also a merch uh, a site where you can get some cool geometric algebra caps or t-shirts and so on. The library we will be using today to do our prototyping is called Ganja.js. Um, and it comes with this little online play playground. So it's uh, zero install. You can just surf there, browse some examples. Uh, you can modify them, uh, run them in the browser and so on. And that's exactly what we'll be doing today. All right. Before we get into it, um, it's probably a good idea. It'll be very simple what we'll be doing today. So if you have any experience with any C style dialect, you should be fine. Um, but there are of course some specifics for geometric algebra and these are actually uh, sort of uh, the same over most of the libraries that you'll find on by Victor. So when we do, did a geometric product up till now, the mathematical syntax would to just be juxt use juxtaposition. And of course, when we're programming, we're going to use the ordinary multiplication for that. The outer product, luckily, is already a Boolean operator, so you can just overload that one. The regressive product, the V, doesn't really have a nice equivalent. Where most of the libraries are using the ampersand. For the inner product, we use a uh, dash, uh, uh, a vertical line. For the duality operator, we use the, uh, the binary not operator. And then the sandwich product, we will use the uh, sign adjust right operator. All right, so we will do two little examples examples in this episode five. Um, first, we will look at some of the very basics and, and some of the methods that you need to work in a dimension independent way by implementing a thin lens example, the paraxial approximation. So given a thin lens uh, with a certain focal distance, uh, find where some source point ends up being focused in the image. Um, and then the second uh, problem that we'll be tackling is a simple inverse kinematic solver. So given a base and a target, calculate all of the joint orientations to get this uh, simple arm to move to the position you want it to move. All right, we will start with a thin lens example. Um, and this is a, a picture I have from a physics Libre text. So it's a sort of classical solution. Um, and this is uh, actually the solution to something called uh, the lens maker equation. It's the simplified version, so the paraxial uh, appro approximation. And um, it'll basically tell you to solve how to solve for these two variables, um, which is basically the distance of the image point and the, the height uh, of the image point away from the optical axis. Um, so these formulas, obviously, they, they're not very geometric, but they do have some advantages. Um, because of the way it's set up and the way it's parametrized, you can use this as an approximation for thin lenses in two dimensions, as in the picture, for a spherical thin lens in three dimensions, or for a cylindrical thin lens in uh, three dimensions. And you would basically get the same formulas. Um, now, of course, the difficulty is going to be uh, finding these input H and uh, D parameters, uh, given some random oriented uh, lens of either of these two types, uh, you will have some uh, work cut out before you actually find D0 and H0 and can use these formulas. So uh, we're going to do uh, exactly this example, but we're going to do it in PGA, of course. Um, and for that, I've prepared a new coffee shop example. So that's just uh, uh, the thing from before where I hit a new button that I changed the fonts a bit up so that it would be easier for you guys to read. 
So to get started with Gantra, yes, we need to create our algebra. Um, to create our algebra, that's just the algebra keyword. We have to specify how many positive, negative, and zero basis vectors we want. So let's start in 2D PGA, which means we want two positive uh, basis vectors, zero negative ones, and one zero basis vector. And the last argument is a function here in which we can just do geometric algebra. So we could do things like uh, check what the basis vector uh, E1 squares do. And you can see here that it squares to one uh, as we expect. Um, it's also quite easy to visualize elements and we'll be doing that. So we can actually uh, return a graph which takes a function and some objects, uh, uh, some options in an object uh, like this. Let's say we want a grid. And now we can return a bunch of elements that we want graphed. So for example, if we graph E1, this would be the linear equation x is equals zero, which would be the y-axis. Um, so I'm not sure you can see it, but let's make the lines a bit thicker. So now it's maybe even more. It's quite clear. That's the y-axis. Similarly, 1e2 would be the uh, x-axis, 1e12. Um, the bivector here is the origin. You can also label elements. So if we uh, follow something up with a, a string, then it actually gets a label. Uh, let's make that a big, bigger too. Right. So we want to do the uh, thin lens example, and we'll create a bunch of variables for that. So let's create our lens variable. Um, and we'll now have to think about um, what type we want it to be. Because remember, we have these two types. Um, and the type actually gets determined to, by what we want to happen when we go to three dimensions. Um, so the lens we're actually going to uh, define as a linear equation. So we're just going to use x is 0 here for our lens which indeed in two dimensions will give us the y-axis, and then when we go to three dimensions, that will actually give us uh, a plane. Um, so that's perfect. Another thing we will need is um, the focal point. Um, so the focal point, when we move to three dimensions, um, we want it to stay a point. So let's say it is uh, this point. So we now have our lens and our focal point. We'll also need a center point. So let's make a center point, which is going to be, again, defined dually, since we want it to be a point when we go to three dimensions. And in this case, it's just the origin. It's going to sit right here. And then we need a point. Let's call it a world point to transform. Um, and that's also always going to be a point. So let's say uh, even more to the left and maybe a little bit uh, up, something like this. And then we just add them to the list to render them. And maybe we should set up some colors here. So if we give a hexadecimal number, it'll interpret it as a color. So we can just make these guys blue and then maybe make this guy red. Something like that. Um, and then we should probably add some labels. Um, Let's say the focal is going to be called F and the center is going to be called C. Right. Um, so the first thing uh, we need to do to do this uh, per actual, per actual uh, approximation for the thin lens is um, we need to construct some rays that emit from this point. And there's a couple of rays where we know exactly how it behaves. So the easiest one is this one. If you go through the center of a thin lens, then nothing happens. You basically just continue straight ahead. Um, so we're going to create that line. Let's call it L1. By simply uh, using the join product, the regressive product, and by simply saying this is the world point joined to the center. So let's render that, see what we get. So that's this line. Um, so that's one line that we know is uh, going through the image point. So if you can find a second line that goes through the image point, it's going to be possible to determine the image point. And we actually know a second line because uh, there's another rule that says that if a ray emits through the focal point, then it will exit the mirror at an orthogonal angle. 
So we can construct that too quite easily. We do it like this. We start with that second line, which is of course just uh, the world joined to the focal. Let's le render that too for a second. That's this line. Now we want to intersect that with the mirror, which is of course really easy. Let's call that the uh, LP for point or something like that. And that would be L2 intersected with the mirror the lens, of course. So that's this point. Let's remove this one so we can clearly see the point. Right, and now we need to have um, this emanating ray and we actually um, need to think about what happens when we do this in three dimensions because we want uh, something that is orthogonal to the, the lens and the point. And the way to do it would be this one. We would say this is LP dot and then any point on the lens joined to LP. So if we render uh, L3 now, we get this line and now we can actually make it the image point by saying maybe in a different color. By simply saying the image point is the intersection of L1 and L3. And let's maybe render a little triangle so that we can still see what's going on. Uh, we can render triangles like this as an array. Um, and so we'll take the world point, we'll take the image point, and we'll take this LP point. And then we need a comma here. Maybe make it a little brighter. So this is our uh, basic setup. We can move our world point and we can see how it basically constructs this line here. It constructs this line here, finds the intersection point, constructs this line here, and then intersects those two lines to figure out where the image point is. And this is of course exactly what we saw on this image here. We have this one line going through the center, that one passes through it, and then we have this line passing through the focal point and where it hits the mirror, it exits uh, straight. So this is the thing that we've just implemented. All right, so we've got this working in 2D now, and because we spent some time thinking about how to define our elements, so we made a lens A1 vector, and then we made the focal center and world, world explicitly D vectors. So if we change this to three dimensions, then our lens is actually a plane but everything else still just works. So we can still just figure out what uh, image point our focal point, uh, what image point our world point ends up at. And we can see that this is now this uh, as expected radially symmetric setup. So if I move left and right or up and down, this always goes, uh, uh, this works the same way. Now this is not all. We don't, we can't just do 2D and 3D with the same piece of code, but we can actually also do the cylindrical lens. Now, if we do the cylindrical lens, then actually what happens is the focal point, it doesn't stay a point, it becomes a line. And the same thing goes for the center. So let us just uh, overwrite our focal and our center um, with the non-dual versions. So we're just gonna take the non-dual versions of these guys. For the center, that's really easy. That's just the origin. And we're back into 2D, so that is one E12. For the focal point, it's the same thing, it's the origin minus. So we take the origin minus 0.5 E to zero. And so this won't change anything if we do it in two, two dimensions, but now if we look at the three dimensional version, what we see is our focal point is now a line, our center of our lens is now a line, and what happens is when we have an image point, it actually gets displayed as a line, so when you put a cylindrical mirror in front of a point, then the image will actually be a line. And if you were to look at these in-between planes that we construct, um, they are now planes. So they were lines before, but you can see now that this L1 plane still goes through the center, but since the center is a line, that means it becomes a plane. And so it hits here. And similarly, the, the L2 plane will go through this guy. Actually make it a bit bigger to see it. So it goes through this thing and it then hits the mirror here, which is of course uh, where L3 will orthogonally be uh, at. 
make it even bigger. Like this. So everything still works um, with the same code and exactly the same setup, uh, even though we change the focal and the center from points to lines. Um, and so if we turn this back off, we get our original setup again. And as you can see, these are for this point is actually the same solution. This is the same point that gets mapped over there, because of course the we o we only changed the way the focal and the center were defined. We didn't actually change them. There's, it's the line through that exact point and the line through this exact point that we had. So that's our first example, the paraxial optics, where we see that in PGA we basically get those same features without the difficulty of having to find these parameters first, and we've done everything really uh, in a very geometric way. So now onto the sec second example where we'll be doing inverse kinematics. Um, so we'll just move this back down to two dimensions and we'll delete all of these. That's our starting point. So we are going to make a kinematic chain. It'll have a number of segments. Let's give that a number. Let's start with, uh, let's say, uh, three segments, something like that. Um, what we'd have to do next is create an array of points. Um, so we create an array of one point more because we want three segments. So we need to have four points for that. Um, and let's fill it in. And again, this is the robot arm example, so we use the dual construction to uh, create our points. Um, let's do i minus uh, n over 2. And let's put them uh, 50 centimeters apart, so that would be 0.5 e1. Let's see what we got. A mistake, of course. Um, I'm not seeing it for a second. Oh, deleted a bit too much here. like this. Yes, so sorry for that. We got our points. Um, so these are four points. Now we need a base point and a target point. And let's just take uh, the first point. And we're going to so force a clone here. And the target, the last point. And we'll render those in a different color. Maybe make the points a bit bigger. Something like that. Um, we also want the segments. So let's make the segments. Lines is an array of n, of course. And then we'll fill it in. E smaller than n. Uh, plus plus e. And we'll say lines e is, and we can just make it an array of, which is a little line segment from point c to point c plus one. And let's render those two. And maybe make them even fatter, something like that. All right. So this is our basic setup. Uh, now what we want is when we move this target. We basically want this arm following us, and at the same time, we want the first point to be restricted by the base. And we will do this in in a with a simple, very geometric iterative uh, iterative procedure. So this is our our, our IK procedure function IK. It will take a base, a target, and a chain. I'm going to use short letters because I have to type them. And then, of course, we will have to call it uh, IK with a base target points. And then the first thing we do is we will um, take this 
last, let's actually move our target a little bit so we can work easily um, a little bit to the left and let's say a little bit uh, up. So our target is here. Um, what we want now is to reach the target. So let's just pretend that we reach it and we'll set the last point to the target. So we say cn.set target. And what we'll do next, of course, is we, we now made this thing too long. So let's move this dot over this line until we restore that length we originally had of 0 0.5. And for that, we actually will need a function that translates a given distance over a line. So let's make that two line distance. And that would be one minus 0 0.5 times distance times one e zero times line dot normalized times the dual of one e zero. This is on the cheat sheet. That's just one of those formulas to know. So we now run over all the points starting from n minus one up to the last point, the first point actually. And what we will do is we will set the point by taking the next point and moving it back with a translation over the line from the current point to the next point over a distance of minus 0 0.5. And of course, there's a mistake. I have all small c's. Like this. Um, so what you can see now is that uh, we're already reaching the target and we've moved all of the other points, but we've let go of the base. And of course, we can't do that. So let's correct that. Let's put the base back in place. Um, so we take the zeroth point and we put it back to the base. Um, like this. And then, of course, we have the same problem now. Now this thing is too long. So let's again restore the length just as we did before. We basically, it's a different four anyway. So now we start from point one and we go up to point uh, n. And what we do is the opposite thing. So we set point e to the previous point, again translated with the previous point joined to the current point, but this time over a distance of 0 0.5. And so what we have now is an inverse kinematic solver, right? And if we turn on the animations, because it'll actually be calling it all the time. And it is uh, quite customizable, so we could have some more of these uh, guys, and that still works. And of course, since again, we, we chose uh, a certain way of defining our points and our lines and doing our movements, and that makes that we can now simply switch this thing to three dimensions, and we get basically a working uh, IK solver in three dimensions, and it's, it's really in three dimensions, so you can now uh, move it uh, all over. Um, and this is the uh, exact same piece of code. All right, so that's it for the inverse kinematic solver. And that uh, concludes uh, episode five. And we'll be back with episode six, where we'll do some more of this programming and we'll actually be programming up a rigid body dynamic solver. Okay, see you in a bit. All right.